God says in Isaiah 55, 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways, mine are higher. So you got to surrender. No arguing. Stop struggling. Give it all to God. I say again, ever wonder why some people seem to get so many blessings and some don't? Secret is still surrender. And I submit to you that none of us will ever be happy. None of us will ever be sane or sweet or wonderful or loving until we totally give our hearts to Jesus. I close with this one story. As I said, I pastored the Ephesus Church. When I was pastoring the Ephesus Church, I, I preached 117 funerals. 117. I averaged a funeral every 18 days for seven years. I have a book. It is called, well, I have several books, but my last book is called, I remember the title, I Will Fear No Evil. In that book, I have a, a story called Key Theology. Thank you. I, I had seen so many things happen at funerals that I had come up with the idea that you can really tell a lot about a person's relationship with God by the way they behave at a funeral. Because I'd seen so much. I've seen people do things at funerals that you wouldn't believe. We, we had a funeral at the Ephesus Church where there were two families. And one, the first family didn't get the money and the second family got the money. And at the cemetery, members of the first family threw the second family down in the hole with the, with the casket. I'm doing a committal. Ashes to ashes, dust. Ah! Down the hole. I've seen stuff happen at funerals. I saw a girl almost lose her mind because she and her mother had a horrible fight. Her mother had long, silky hair that she used to straighten with the straightening comb. Remember the straightening comb? Mm hmm. I'm trying to act like you remember. You remember. She would put it on the fire and then straighten her hair with it. And, and then oil the hair, you know, so you don't damage the hair, and straighten it. And somehow her hair brushed across the flame, hair caught on fire, she burned to death. And that girl had to remember that the last word she said to her mother was, I hate you, I will see you in hell. She had to live with that. I did a funeral in Ephesus while I was pastoring there where the mother put in the casket with her son a fifth of liquor, a gold cross, and an Uzi submachine gun. So I said, you can tell a lot about a person by what they do at a funeral. We did a funeral in Ephesus. There were four sisters. And I got two members of my church, well, several in this audience. Four sisters. They, there were three sitting here. And now Ephesus Church, there are some rules you got to go by when you, when you do a funeral. There is a, 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 what do you call it? A partition in the front. And the congregation is asked to march around and view the body but the family does not do that the family sits in the front row they stand the casket is wheeled to them and then they lean over the petition and pay their final respects that's that's the regime that's what we do at the Ephesus Church in Manhattan New York now evidently when this sister's body was wielded up to that partition the sister sort of put her hips up on the partition to lean over and kiss her sister in the castle. And for some reason, as yet unknown to me, the, 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 the undertaker had not locked the wheels. Because when you, when you wheel a castle up there, you hit the thing and you lock the wheels so that it does not roll. So when she fulcrumed up onto the, 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 the petition and leaned over to kiss her sister, the casket rolled away from her. She ended up flipping over the petition, 
knocking herself out cold in the middle of the Ephesus Seventh-day Adventist Church with her dress and slip up in the air over her head just like this. Now, I'm the youngest pastor in the history of the Ephesus Church. I'm pretty good on thinking on my feet, but they don't teach you this at Oakland University. You're not going to get this here. You're not going to get naked woman in the middle of a church on a funeral in class. So she's out cold. Dress up, slip up, like that. And I'm, I'm the pastor, and the congregation is looking at me as if to say, come on, Murray, fix it. And I'm standing, I, I got my white robe on, because I always wear white to funerals. Darlene is sitting right there. She remember, I, I never wore black to funerals. I always wore white to funerals. Particularly when the person was a Christian, I figured white is right tonight. We're not wearing black. I didn't wear black to a person who loved Jesus and went, went to sleep in Christ. Wear white. So I wear white. So I'm standing in my white robe. Nice brocade, purple. Nice white robe. And I didn't know what to do. You can't look down. So you kind of just look around. Now I got maybe half a dozen elders behind me. All of them older than me, white haired, men of the cloth. So I turn to my elders. My elders are looking at Jesus. Ephesus Seventh-day Adventist Church. I, I, I got deacons. At least a dozen deacons. Black suits, white ties, little white gloves. They're sitting right there. I look at my deacon. My deacon. Looking at Jesus. I turn to my deaconesses. Mothers of the church. Little white dresses, little white stockings, little white shoes, little white hat. It's their job. It's the job of a deaconess to fix stuff like that. That's what you got deaconesses for. Make the pastor look good. That's your job. So I turn to my deaconesses. My deaconesses decide it's time for a prayer meeting. So we just stood there. Everett Gibson is the organist, playing the organ. She realized there's nothing going on, so she stopped playing the organ. So now the church is deathly silent. And we just stood there. And you know what saved me? I said, save me, save us. One of the sisters got up, came around, and said to her sister lying there on the ground, get up, Bertha. <laughs> Woman sat up, pulled her slip down, pulled her dress down, and I said, let us stand for the best direction. Let the Lord walk between me and thee. Brother Rasta, let's get up out of here. And so I'm, I'm saying to you, I'm saying to you that I've, I've seen, I'm looking at this watch, it's dead, it's not working. I'm saying to you that I'd seen so much happen at a funeral that I said you could really tell a lot about the, a person's relationship with God by the way they behave at a funeral. But I changed that to what I call key theology. It's in my book, I Will Fear No Evil. Because I believe you can tell more about a person's relationship with God by what they do when they lose something as seemingly insignificant as their key as opposed to something big like their job or their health or something like that. How many
many have ever lost their keys? All right. If you have keys, you've lost them. Now, what do you do when you lose your keys? Three minutes and I'm done. Now, folks like to be all crazy. Say, I pray. No, you don't. You don't pray. When you lose your keys, you look for them. You lose your keys, you look for them. Where did I leave my keys? Now, you go to where you think your keys are. You cannot find them. Now, what do you do? Now, you don't pray. Stop that. You don't pray. You know what you do? You look someplace else. What if you're running out of time? You know what you do? You get mad. Yeah, that's what you do. You get mad. And the less time you have, and the harder to find your keys, the madder you get. Sometimes you get so mad you can't even talk. Now, quickly. Getting mad works against you. Two things. If you were to pray, two things would happen. Listen to me carefully. One, you would get divine help. I'm serious. Because everything that touches you touches God. Do you believe that? Everything that touches you touches God. Everything that concerns you concerns God. Everything that disturbs you disturbs God. So God is as interested in you finding your keys as you are. Yes, he is. So if you would pray, you'd get divine help. Two, if you would pray, your mind would calm down and you'd be able to think. Anger constricts thought process. So praying gives you godly help, but it also opens up your brain so you can think. You may be sitting on your keys, but you don't know it because you're mad. So talk to Jesus and get some divine help and let your mind open up. That's why sometimes we say things and do things when we're mad and he said, was that, did I say that, was that me? Yeah, that was you. Pray and calm down. Now you can go to Jesus mad, but you can't stay in his presence mad. Talking to him is a calming thing. So you get divine help. So then this, if you are accustomed to going to Jesus over little things like your keys, when the doctor says to you, like he said to me several years ago, that's cancer. You don't lose your mind. You don't get all crazy. You realize the same God that got you this far is going to get you home if you keep your hand in his hand. No sense falling apart now. Trust God. You trust him over your keys. Trust him with your life. So you can walk the road to Jesus, even if you've got to walk it blindfold and alone. When I got my cancer diagnosis, it was just me and Irma. That's all. I didn't get crazy. I didn't fall apart and say, oh God, I'm about to die. Because I knew I wasn't about to die. Because God told me. You ain't about to die. Huh? Now let me get a little indelicate and then I'm done. Two minutes and I'm finished. And I know every man here over 40 years old can relate to me, whether you want to admit it or not, or, and possibly most women. At our house, I can get up in the middle of the night, go to the bathroom, do what I have to do, go back to bed and never turn the light on and never miss a beat. Yeah, as you get older, stuff rearranges itself. Sometimes you got to get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom. Come on, say amen. Or ouch. But if you turn on the light, it wakes you up. You know, so you just do it in the dark. I do it in the dark, wash my hands, put the towel back or whatever, trot on back to bed, go back to sleep, no problem. A few minutes later, Irma gets up, trot on in the bathroom, do what she has to do, come on back to bed, no problem. Now why are we so good that we can do that? Do we have x-ray vision, radar scope? No, no, no. It's simply repetition. Amen? Because you do it most nights, sometimes two or three times a night. It's just repetition. You walk that road every night and unless one of my shoes or one of Irma's shoes or something's in the way, there's going to be no accidents, no problems. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's the way it is with Jesus. You see, you walk that road to Christ every day over the little things in life. Come on, listen to me now. You walk it over the little things in life so that when the doctor says you got cancer or you're going to lose your job or your mother is hurt and going to die or your father is going to die or your children are going to die and I've done funerals for all of the above, you don't fall apart. You walk that same road to Jesus that you've been walking all of your life. You walked it every single day. You walked it every, many times a day. So now when something big comes, if the pastor can come, praise God. But if he can't come, you walk it by yourself because you know that road. Baptized my father one month before he had a stroke and died. And Irma's father gave his heart two weeks before he, he uh, had a heart attack and died. I tell you, I said, your father's a show-off. He had to beat my father by two weeks. But I didn't fall apart. And she didn't fall apart. Because we'd walked that road to Jesus. We surrendered to Christ. We've given it all to Jesus. And when you commit your life to Jesus, Jesus gives you control. So you can tell a lot more about a person's relationship with God by what they do when they lose their keys than what they do when they get a diagnosis or they lose a spouse. And if you're accustomed to walking with Jesus over little things like keys, you'll know where he is when that big thing comes. Amen? It's all about surrender, brothers and sisters. That's all. It's about total, non-negotiated, white flag waving surrender. And the quicker you do it, the only regret you will have is that you didn't do it sooner. The secret is now, has always been, will always be surrender.